everyone. It, it's wonderful to see all of us here today with our different ages, races, cultures, and nationalities. My name is Karen Bustamante, but before I say more, I want to recognize our wonderful board of directors at the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center. Our board is led by our chair, Mr. Roderick Lee. Please give our board a hand. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, every day we encounter injustice. Racism is real and we must always confront it at all levels. Poverty continues to grow while a few become richer. Our schools are lacking and are not providing all of their students with an education. The world continues to suffer because of war. In order for us to make a change in our schools, our community, and the world, we must commit to nonviolence. Brothers and sisters, we all have the power to create change. Power is the ability to achieve purpose. To become nonviolent leaders, we must be true to ourselves and to our cause. As advocates of nonviolence, we must improve our thoughts and our spirits as we advance in our journey. We are the ones who need to dedicate ourselves to self-control. We need to hold back our desires to act impulsively or without conscious thought. We have plenty of nonviolent leaders whom we can learn from, such as Dr. King, Congressman John Lewis, and Reverend James Lawson. We become the nonviolent change that we want to see within our community. Through nonviolence, our voices will be heard. If we fight the people who have angered us, then we have lost. If we threaten the people who have infuriated us, then we have lost. We cannot lose this fight. We must stay nonviolent. Too much is at stake, and humanity needs us to be engaged, nonviolent citizens of this world. Brothers and sisters, how will we look to the rest of the world if we cannot solve our own difficult problems? If we continue to rely on nonviolence, we will not only fail to solve our problems, but we would have more of them. Young people, let's keep Dr. King's legacy alive. We must commit to nonviolence, to the truth, to justice. It may sound like a huge responsibility, which it is. But committing to justice includes doing small things each and every day. It can mean public speaking and organizing. But if you're passionate about something, like writing, then write a letter to a congressperson, to a senator, to the city council, to the school board. If you're passionate about rapping or singing, then rap or sing about freedom and justice. If you're passionate about art, then make a mural to express the way that your community is hurting due to injustice. This list is endless, my friends. If we want to make a change, let's really commit to nonviolent acts. Let's speak to our elders and really consider their advice. Let's keep fighting for the change that we want to see in our community and around the world. Thank you.
Yane Lighthall and Karen Bustamante, only a reflection of this incredible youth and brilliance that we have today in our community that we don't really hear about in all the different areas that they're shining on a daily basis right here in our community. We're so, so proud of you. These are young people who have been with me in Selma, and they've marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. They've had a chance to meet Congressman John Lewis and all of the foot soldiers and heroes and sheroes of the Civil Rights Movement, and they have come back here to Oakland, California to teach and to educate others about the principles of nonviolence and about the legacy of those individuals such as Reverend Lawson who really made so many sacrifices so that they could have a shot at the American dream and so they could, too, rise up and be the next leaders of, of our world. So I just wanted you to get a chance. You, you guys, say, say something. Why don't you say something to our, to our audience real quick, okay? Because Elihu's not here. Come on. You, so just say one word. You know, we have to speak in one minute on the floor, so you guys can say something in a minute. Just being a part of the Martin Luther King um, Junior Freedom Center is such an inspirational and changing place to be like we get to learn so much and we change ourselves and we teach others about what we've been learning and how much influence it has had in our daily lives and we just are so thankful for this program and being able to change our thoughts and our mind to be able to change the world Well, being one of the youngest students in the Freedom Center makes me feel like, really special going on these amazing journeys. Before, the, before I was with the Freedom Center, I didn't have this great experience to go on great trips with congressmen and women. And meeting the president has been like a dream for me. And like when I went to Selma, I got to, well, meet him. <laughs> And, well, the um, Freedom Center has taught me so many things about nonviolence and how it saves our world from, well, violence. And it's made the world better. So I just want to thank Roy, Karen, and everyone for letting me have a chance in the Freedom Center. I believe being a part of the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center has really, like, helped me open my eyes to see the challenges people face every day and to be inspired by leaders, past leaders who have helped us create the path. And it helps us realize that the path isn't, isn't done yet. We still have to create that path and keep on going. You know, in school, we always learn about like the civil rights movements and how like all these old folks, you know, did all the change. Well. <laughs> But like what this program taught was, you know, those old folks, well, they're old now, but they were all our age back then. And the same, if we're facing the same problems, then the youth of today got to step up and be the youth that were, you know, back then. And so this program has helped me, you know, sort of see that. And I think that it's really important to acknowledge how the youth are the ones that should be responsible for the future. Thank you. As Jack said, it's really important to know that the youth are at the core of all of these revolutions and are at the core of what we want, which is justice. And something um, on the trip to Selma that Miss Dor Dorothy Cotton told us was that she was not ready to pass on her torch. She said she would hold on to it until the very last day that she could. She said, I will help you light your own torch, but I won't give mine away. So it's, yes, exactly. So it's very important for us to know that we have those torches and that we are the future. Now, last year, the Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, reopened. We had probably five or six students from the Martin Luther King Freedom Center accompany me there for the, new, the reopening of the museum. And once again, they marched in the parade down Memphis. They had Oakland's banner, the Martin Luther King Freedom Center. 
And the next day, on the front page of the newspaper, the headlines, Oakland students from the Martin Luther King Freedom Center come march and come participate in the opening of the Civil Rights Museum. So they make us very proud. They're doing quite a job, quite a job. And so this is really about our young people. It's about our youth. Many of our students have traveled to Ferguson. They've traveled to Ferguson, bringing Oakland's spirit of justice the spirit of nonviolence and the spirit of encouraging peaceful protests and our First Amendment rights to challenge the brutality of what is taking place, not only in Ferguson, but in Oakland and throughout the country. And so these young people are on the ground wherever they need to be, helping and organizing and teaching and really being part of that change throughout the country. And once again, Given what I'm dealing with in Washington, D.C., Keith, with the Tea Party and all the budget cuts and, you know, the fact that they won't let us reauthorize the Voting Rights Act 50 years later and all of the great society programs such as Head Start, Higher Ed Act, Medicare, Medicaid, Section 8, HUD, all of these great society programs that have lifted people out of poverty. Now, of course, you know who wants to cut them. Well, that's what I have to do each and every day, fight and try to beat them back. But I come home, <laughs> I come home to my young people and to my community, and that's what keeps me going. And so I just want to thank all of you and our young people for giving me the chance to do it. Let me say this about nonviolence. It'll echo with what the young people were doing. Gandhi... And Dr. King say nonviolence is composed of three elements. One is the dedication to the development of self-control. Self-control is absolutely necessary for a full life, for a whole life. The second element is the ability to learn how to learn. Unfortunately, as an educator, we as a sector, have conveyed for too long that learning is a matter of willpower. It's a single, linear, analog activity. Well, actually, learning is a very intricate process that involves the neurological system, our chemical system, our electromagnetic system, our bodies and all of its senses and our experiences. So there's a pre-learning that takes place called learning, how to learn. Once you learn how to learn, you're pretty much able to figure out life. The third component is making a vow to truth. When Gandhi or Dr. King or other nonviolence leaders say truth, they don't mean the truth. They don't mean a truth. They mean a more precise or a more accurate understanding of the thoughts and feelings of another person without giving up your own thoughts and feelings. This leads to the capacity for analytical thinking and the development of collaboration. I want to tell a story tonight <laughs> um, because I don't know how many of you understand it, but, but the, the movement of the 50s and 60s, especially around what I call the Black Freedom Movement, uh, what some historians have called the Second American Revolutionary Period. Um, was not only um, 17 years of my life that uh, represented some of the most arduous times I've ever experienced, but also was, was a time of great exhilaration and excitement, great joy, great music, great humor and good cheer. And so Ralph Abernathy one day, one night in one of the mass meetings told this story, and I'm gonna relate it to you. It was in that kind of a period He tells of a, a southern city and the bus company. And onto the bus company, 
um, at a bus stop, getting on the bus was a huge, dark-skinned black man. And um, he was so big he couldn't, he had to bend in the middle of his back to be in the, to be it, to stand up in the bus. He quickly jumped on the bus, he quickly took a seat directly behind the driver. And then the white driver noticed this Negro behind him, sitting behind him. And he said to the window with some amount of anger, boy, you can't sit there, get up, go to the back of the bus. And this man, this passenger just sat there, didn't budge and didn't even seem to look at the driver. Uh, after a few moments, the driver, the second time with a little, much, much more noise, said, boy, get up and get to the back of the bus. And still, uh, the man sat, nothing on his face changing. He sits there. After a little longer period, the driver, who's up to this time, refused to start the bus, says, boy, can't you hear me? And he's enraged. Can't you hear me? I said, get up and go to the back of the bus. And the man still sat there for a few seconds quietly. Then he pulled himself up. And he was big, as I've said already. He walked one step and stood next to the driver and he looked down at the driver. He said, Mister, I want to say to you two things. Number one, I ain't no boy. And number two, I ain't one of them nonviolent Negroes. <laughs> I want to speak from the theme, uh, where do we go from here, chaos or community, with this sideline message that I saw also, what is the future of nonviolence in the, the USA? What is our future of nonviolence at all? That's the central question from the 50s and 60s that I think we have, I want us to hear this tonight because it's still the question for the 21st century. We have come a long way, as Brother Carson has said, but we have a long, 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 long way yet to go. The Ferguson is just one example of it, a form of the racism that has not yet been faced by our nation. The violence towards ordinary people, the slave, the Indian, the Mexican, women across our history. And it, it's not a, a violence that is discontinued or that we have stopped. I think of Mary Dyer who was hung on the commons of Boston, Massachusetts somewhere around 1659. And the women who were called witches and hung and burned. So the business of violence as we have become the USA is as much a part of our history as the name of the country, the United States of America. We have not dislodged that violence. In the sh police shootings, the principle, it seems to me, is not about the force that the police officers use, but it's about of how we as a country across these three or four hundred years can claim to be who we are and yet 
a completely unarmed 12-year-old boy or 19-month-old baby, this happened in Los Angeles several years ago, can be shot by the police and we the people let it happen and nothing happens to begin to dislodge and dismantle that kind of despising attitude in the United States that a resident unarmed can be shot by the police. And the nation as a whole pretend that's normal procedure. Now, you can't go out here in the streets of Oakland and do that and not get convicted of first or second degree murder or manslaughter. But a police officer can. So the, the movement of the 50s and 60s was not, uh, in my judgment, easily named the civil rights movement. I don't like the name. It's a movement It's about trying to make liberty and justice and equality for all and to create a society where indeed we are trying seriously and deliberately and making gain on being true to our word. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal. We the people, in order to ensure a more perfect union, do establish these United States of America. I want specifically to push you to understand that what we call the civil rights movement is a massive omnibus movement with many different dimensions. And I represent, as did John Lewis and many others who've been named here this evening, I represent, we represent the nonviolent direct action campaign. And we said something like this, that it's not enough to have legislative decisions. It's not enough to have legal decisions that clean up the Constitution. We, the people, must organize ourselves in such a way that we go into the streets and we engage in direct action, sit-ins, boycotts, kneel-ins, wait-ins, lay-down issues, Virgil... Uh, picketing of all kinds. We go in, in fact, in a sense, to the enemy camp with a strategy that's the purpose of dramatizing not simply our protest, our dissent, but dramatizing the fact that it is time for people to wake up and for the changes to be made that must be made. That's the notion of nonviolence. And I would add to that something else, that you cannot have a democratic society without ordinary citizens being informed and engaged and taking action all the time in their local communities to make the democracy real. Can't be done. Cannot be done. A democratic society, from my perspective of study and reading, requires an engaged people. Yeah. And every person has to see himself or herself as one of those who's so devoted to a better society, to doing things justly and truly and beautifully that they themselves understand what the issues are of their neighbors and they are willing to identify themselves with all their neighbors. That's a part of the power of the nonviolent approach. So the nonviolent perspective that began with the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. But every year after that, for 20 years, there was a major campaign that basically pushed the envelope for change in the United States. In 1960, it was the sit-in campaign. 1961, it was the Freedom Ride. 1962, it was the Albany Movement. Every single year, where literally millions of people marched where tens of thousands of people went to jail, 
where there were actions of different kinds all across the nation, and literally hundreds and hundreds of actions of many different sorts, north, south, east, and west. And I describe to this you for one single reason. That is, if our nation, this 315 million people, are to know a future that is full of justice and peace and hope, that kind of campaign must happen again in the 21st century. There's no, there's no other way about it. It must happen. And what some of us are still trying to do is to lay the soil for the 21st century nonviolent campaigns that the nation must have. The other thing I want to say about that is this. I've named it. We cannot change our country only by fighting racism. Racism is deeply sexist. It's history. I don't care whether it's a black church or anybody else. We cannot contend with racism if we will not deal with the sexism. After all, I think it's true. I think it's true. After all, I think it's true that um, sexism is the first oppression. The oppression of women, more than half of the human population, taking them out of responsibility not only for family life and home life and small communities around them, but taking them out of participation fully as equal people in all the matters of public life is one of the reasons we're not as good a country as we ought to be. And Oakland is not as good as Oakland as it ought to be. That's, that's, my, that's my perspective on the matter. And we cannot be for dismantling racism and sexism if we're not in favor of dismantling violence. No way for that to happen. Violence and sexism and racism all have the same ideological perspective. That perspective is quite simple. Those three isms believe, well, let me say it a different way. Uh, violence is premised upon the fact and the notion that some people cannot be talked to or treated with compassion and care. They can only be controlled by violence. Sexism says, of course, that women are inferior. They're not in the image of creation. And racism says that certain complexions are what the KKK call mud people and must have been formed by some satanic entity and not by the God of gods, the God who made the heavens and the earth. They still say that in the United States. And then these cannot be tackled if we do not deal with plantation capitalism. That's the kind of economy we have for the most part, the plantation capital. It began with the expansion of Western civilization from Europe to the, Africa, to Asia, South America, to North America. Plantation capitalism does not believe the earth belongs to all the people birthed on it. Plantation capitalism believes that a fact a working person who, and all of us have to work, not only the care for ourselves and our own and intimate environment, but we have to work in order to be able to support our children, ourselves, our families, to influence the surroundings that we live in. But plantation capitalism believes that those who do the labor are property rather than human. One of, the, one of the ways that this is so true that I have seen in the last 20 or 30 years, the presidents of the United States who boast of how many new jobs have been created while they were presidents. And 50% of those new jobs that have been created in the last 30 years are jobs for 
poverty wages, where a person or a family cannot support itself from the income. And every, it is, as Martin King has said, a crime against humanity, a crime against God for a person to work and then have to be on food stamps. It's not that there's anything wrong with the food stamps. That's one of the responsibilities of a society. If a family cannot feed itself, we are supposed to see to it that we help them fe feed themselves. That's in the good book. This society has always sought for 400 years to keep some people down and out. That's what plant ca plantation capitalism has done and this continues to do. These four isms are together. They are connected. They represent spiritual forces of wickedness. They represent sin. They represent the brokenness of the human family here and all around the world. Our task must be, if we sense our humanity, our task must be to help one another form and shape and prepare the soil out of which will come the most creative nonviolent campaigns that the world has ever seen that will help this nation then to recover its soul and to recover its life. <laughs> Nothing is more important than that. And it must be, it must be nonviolent campaigns. And so finally, I want to then stalk, talk about nonviolence itself. Nonviolence is a 20th century concept coined by Mohandas Gandhi of India around 1906, 1907, 1908. Between the, in those three years, from my own studies, that's when he coined, and he writes that in some of his writings, I coined the term in order to try to help people understand the power of nonviolence. Nonviolent power, he insists, is love power. So he writes, the nonviolence is not a negative term. The non means love, compassion. And he insists that love is the energy of the universe, the most powerful power that we have. And that if we human beings would recover that power of creation, we would be astonished at what our lives could accomplish and what we could accomplish together. Now, many of you practice nonviolence, whether you say you do or not. Because we black people in the United States formed a song called the Negro Spiritual. And I have gone through uh, some 8,000 um, Negro Spiritual pieces. That is the, the first sentence or middle line or last line. More than 8,000 fragments that are still. We don't know the, but the, we don't know the melodies and whatnot, but these were songs composed by slaves in the field and in the plantations. And in those songs, you will find no word of retaliation or hatred. In those songs, go grab some of the books that are available. In those songs, there's always the effort for them to stay alive and to keep their souls intact. So today, for an example, there's no black leadership that calls for retaliation or revenge. Can you imagine that? After a hundred years of lynching, after all the shootings of black folk by police officers around our own country, you will not find in the black community <laughs> 
a set of leaders who have any kind of leadership or following who call for revenge or retaliation. And most black folk in this sanctuary will have in places where they've been hard put, you don't call it turn the other cheek, but you will have tried to solve a hostile moment not by retaliation or fear, but find a way to come back and help the person change his mind or her mind. We have done that for now 350 years, large numbers of us. And our leadership has always called for more justice, not retaliation. More access, more opportunity, not imitating the opponent that we have faced every day of our lives in many, many different cases. Now I'm saying that that is the source of nonviolence that I love and that I heard as a child. In my black, in my family rather, in my St. James AME Zion Church where my dad was a pastor where we were raised. Go down Moses. Wade in the water. These are all songs about we're on our way to the promised land. We're going to change this nation in which we live. We're in a plight in our country because too many people are imitating the despising of some human beings. And how far will we really be able to go if we continue that hatred of one another and the hatred of some people in our midst? Hate the Indian. This is our history. Hate the witch. Hate the slave. Hate the black person. Hate the Mexican-American. In the last 30 or 40 or 50 years, we've escalated violence everywhere. The problem, in my judgment, is not that people overseas hate us and not that people overseas are different from us except through culture and language and religion and many other ordinary human features. The problem is that our policies of the Western world, led by my own dear country, are policies that only can only escalate wrong, escalate injustice, escalate torture, escalate killing, escalate despising of other people. Nonviolence insists that if you keep on doing an eye for an eye, then soon everyone is going to be blind and you will have accomplished nothing. Our nation cannot go on shooting unarmed citizens and residents of our land. Simply cannot. That is the way of perishing. Nonviolence is reaching back into the ancient wisdom of the human race and seeing that our very birth is a creative energy coming from eternity. And that if we use the power of our birth, life, the power of our birth, love, we not only gain a sense of personal power and confidence, we not only tap the great potential of life of the universe that is in every single one of us, but we will discover that life has infinite capacity to overcome wrong with right, to turn the other cheek, to face injury with pardon, disease with healing, and torture with care. Each person can be a singular power that is a reflection of eternity. And that is power, especially if we learn to live it and learn to use it and understand it. That's nonviolence. So the call to nonviolence is a call to be fully 
human. To be yourself in all the spectacular ways that's true. Nonviolence also insists that it's power. And so ordinary people, campaigns are begun by ordinary people organizing a handful of people around an issue and working on it. Many of you are doing exactly that. The first level of non-power is the person, personal. The second level of non-violence is forming a community, your own family, your own intimates. The third level of power is creating a campaign in your community about a wrong that needs to be corrected, an issue of justice that needs to be established. A part of the work we have to do here is the work of recovering our history. Recovering our history. All across our own country, uh, there are wonderful illustrations in biography in every decade, in every century of people who through nonviolence has made, have made a great difference. So where do we go from here? Now, I've named first the task to say the struggle is not over. We have lost a lot of water and ground, I think, in the last 20 years. Uh, in the community of goodwill in our cities, uh, we do not come together as a resisting movement for uh, in our cities. The black community in many ways I maintain is not resisting the toxic realities in our society. I think that nonviolence is the way that change can take place. I recall the 61 Freedom Campaign, Freedom Ride Campaign where just 16 people began a ride on a desegregated fashion down the east coast of Atlanta, uh, of the Atlantic uh, uh, coast, rather. When they hit Birmingham, they met the FBI, the KKK, the White Citizens Council, the local police. And so there was a bus that was burned Another bus was, was met in Birmingham with, by a white mob. The police stood aside, disappeared, and that white mob tried to devastate the 13 riders on that bus. The riders were so injured and so hurt that they felt they could not go on. They wanted to, uh, so they decided to stop the ride in Birmingham. And I think that that would have changed the very character of what happened down the road. Selma probably would not have happened. The Freedom Summer probably would not have happened. Because Gandhi taught me at least, and I taught many people the same thing, that when the enemy uses violence against you, then you need to stand still and evaluate what's going on and see then if you can strategize not to let it stop you. To go under it, around it, through it, over it, but systematically figure out what that moment brings and how you can continue the campaign. And so we in the Nashville movement, not just our students, but our pastors and others, housewives and what, who were there, we had a long heart searching. We had followed the bus, Freedom Ride bus, Freedom Ride. We were convinced that it was an important tactic. We were convinced if we let that violence stop a peaceful assembly, it could well spell the end of the emerging movements. 
And so we in Nashville picked up the ride. We had a long, long discussion. Um, and we decided that we could not let the enemy stop a legitimate campaign. That's, that was a decision that was made. It's not clearly in the history books because I've read a number of the reports about it. But we decided we cannot allow the enemy to stop a legitimate campaign to go forward. And so we decided we will recruit among ourselves volunteers and we will pick up the ride at Birmingham. We will send people to Birmingham who will then ride the bus to Montgomery and take the ride bus to Jackson and elsewhere. And that meant that we set out a call for people um, to come and join the ride. And it meant that the Kennedy administration that had wanted us to stop anyway was outraged that we continued, but we continued anyway. It meant that over 400 of us uh, were in the jails of Mississippi and in the torture camp of Parchment the summer of 1961. But as a consequence, the task of desegregating America took another step forward, incremental and small, but it took a step that meant then that Selma could happen, that the 64 Civil Rights Bill could be passed, and the 65, and the 66, and the 68, and so forth and so on. Now that's the power of people. Now I want to say to you something that's very hard, that is this. Poverty and racism and economic equality, inequality, plantation capitalism is alive and well in the United States because too many of us passively consent to them. Too many of us. We have to come to the place in the deep of our own souls and with one another where we say something like this. For the rest of my life, I am not going to knowingly support or participate in racism, sexism, violence, or plantation capitalism. I'm going to withdraw my cooperation. Nonviolence knows that we can have a better world, a better Oakland, a better nation. But it will begin to occur in much greater impact when ordinary people like you and I, we in this sanctuary, determine in Oakland that I no longer laugh at those people who say I'm nonviolent. I will no longer applaud the little violence of cursing at another person or abusing another person or carrying on with my children in a way that's wrong. I no longer will participate in the harassment of women. I will let my life be a singular life that seeks to be the revolutionary, we, the revolution we must have. Martin King laid it on the line to the nation. Where do we go over here? Chaos or community? He said, coexistence or non-existence. Coexistence or annihilation. So I urge sisters and brothers that we understand the movement of the 50s and 60s is the great expansion of the, of the t discussion of freedom in our midst and did bring great personal change and social change and legal change and legislative change and community change. And I invite you to join the Martin Luther King's Freedom Center. Join these young people who are engaged in such a marvelous way for the change of themselves and the change of their community and the places where they work and live, I invite you to join the center 
I invite you to join the center by deciding I'm going to be a part of the nonviolent campaigns that will make America for me and America for every boy and girl everywhere in our land. It can be so. Let us make it so. Heaven, my home. 